All right, if everyone can uh, quiet down. All right. So uh, if anyone wants to try Moodle again, uh, please give it a shot. It works? OK. So one vote of confidence. Uh, so it was just in the wrong term, so it should all be good now. Uh, if it doesn't work, then uh, there's also a chance also that you're not in Moodle. And you can email me your student ID, and I can add you uh, manually to it. OK, uh, one other topic that came up uh, during questions uh, I thought was relevant to you all uh, is, is I'll just explain. Some people are uh, wondering about the uh, thesis space option uh, for our masters. And so this is something that uh, some of you may have applied to originally. Uh, it's a hard program to get into because you need a supervisor. Uh, so it's also a paid position. Uh, the course load is a lot less. It's three courses, I think, maybe four courses. But, but then you do a thesis, so it, it's still about a two-year degree. Uh, it's a Master's of Applied Science as opposed to a Master's of Engineering. Um, so that's an option. Um, so if you were more research interested, then a thesis-based option might be a better choice for you. Uh, if, if you like the courses, taking a lot of courses and that type of thing, then there's a course-based option. And then there is a kind of middle road uh, where you can do a project that replaces a course. So we call it the five credit project. And um, I, don't, I haven't checked in on the details recently for it. You also need a supervisor, so someone's going to supervise you, uh, but it's more like a two-term project. And you would do that instead of taking one or two courses, uh, and, and you would get credits uh, for, for doing it. So those are all the options that are available to you. Uh, on a personal level, I probably am going to hire one or two new master's, thesis-based master's students starting in January. So at, if at the end of this term you really like the research aspects, and you do well in the course and things like that, uh, shoot me an email like December-ish, or you can also apply through my website, and I'll, I'll remind you probably again in, in December type of thing. Um, but if that's of interest to you, I, I'm happy to hear from you. And the fact that you're already here at Concordia is, is helpful. Um, it's harder to recruit students when they're not here because there's, there's all sorts of uh, reasons why they might not ever make it. Uh, and so, um, so yeah, so I'm happy to, to, to choose students that are already in the MEng program, uh, if, if available, if there's interest uh, from the students. So anyway, something to think about. Uh, it, I mentioned it's paid. It's not paid a lot. You just get a, you get a research stipend. Uh, it's not like a, a salary or, or anything like that, but you get a little bit of money uh, to, to, to work on it. OK. Uh, all right, so let's uh, jump into the course itself. Um, OK, so the, the highest level course or goal of this course is uh, hopefully you all get jobs in security, right? That's why you're, you're here taking a master's in security. And so you're going to show up on your first day of your new job. And since you're the security person uh, where you work, then somebody's going to hand you something and they're going to say, OK, we want to know whether this is secure. Okay? And how do you go about answering that question? That's what this course is really about. Okay? So where do you even get started when you want to try and answer that question? Because it's a very complicated question to try and answer. So you're given. We'll just call it x, where x could be any number of things. And you're asked, is it secure? OK. Now, I wish I could tell you that there's one methodology you could use it, and it's always going to work. Uh, but that's not the case at all. Okay? And part of the complexity comes from the fact that you could be handed a lot of different things. right? And the methodology that you use is going to depend a lot on what exactly it is that you're being handed. So for example, you might be handed some software. Since it's the very first lecture, I'll try and keep my notes tidy for a bit. Okay, and even software itself is pretty complicated, right? Like there's there's a lot of different types of software. Like it could be an operating system, it could be an app. The app could be a mobile app, it could be a web app, it could be uh, a decentralized app, 
um, could be like a database or something like that. Okay, what are some other things that you could be handed that's not software? That, that you think that companies are interested in the security of? IoT device. Okay, so it could be some sort of IoT device. So I'll put that under hardware, just call it hardware. So IoT is Internet of Things, uh, basically small internet connected devices. We could just put devices as well. Um, what are other hardware? Servers. Say it again. Servers. Okay, so servers, just computers themselves, CPUs. Uh, it could be like, a, um, well, anyways, let's, uh, I'll leave it at that. Um, what else? Vehicles. Say again. Vehicles. Vehicles. Okay, so uh, let's put that under hard, actually, okay. So sometimes we call them cyber physical. So it is a kind of hardware, it's just, you can, I, this isn't meant to be like, I'm not trying to say this is different than hardware or anything like that. It's a type of hardware, uh, but it usually has a digital component, but the digital component is actually changing things in the real world. There's some actuator uh, that, that, that's making a change. So it could be a car, um, could be like a drone. Could be, you know, like airplanes themselves have a lot of computerized components. There's a whole, the security of airplanes is a very tightly regulated field. Um, safety intersects uh, with security as well. Uh, what else? Okay, so it could be, let's say like, yeah, okay, so machinery, you could have factories, that type of thing. You could have nuclear plants, uh, so for example, Stuxnet was a, a malware that targeted the cyber physical uh, system, uh, smart grid. Okay, we don't need to. We don't need all the examples. But anyways, what, what's another like sort of broad category? Okay, so uh, we I'll call that physical. Okay, so there's all the physical security itself. Okay, so you could have like a safe or a vault, locks, like locks on doors, security access keys, all of that stuff. Yeah, so we'll call it surveillance. Okay, what else? Uh, okay, okay, so I heard network clearly. So networking is kind of in between. It's not really software or hardware. It kind of connects with all of them, so we can give it its own. So networking could be, you know, we have things like servers, so maybe that's under hardware. It could be the protocols uh, themselves, um, the middle boxes, that type of thing. It could be more the physical infrastructure, the actual like wires and cables and, and whatever. Okay, so someone said AI, I think. Um, okay, so AI I, we can think of as a kind of protocol, right? So another thing that you might think is like an algorithm, right? Is an algorithm secure? That's actually a pretty reasonable question. Uh, in fact, there's cryptography is basically the study of secure algorithms, right? So crypto AI, um, like social network, like algorithms, that kind of thing. There's, uh, so security includes privacy, so any of these things that have a privacy consideration um, is also relevant. So it'd be like measuring trust messages and something that would be Okay, yeah, so that could go under networking, so that's kind of a networking protocol. It's like a, a communication protocol. It worries about message delivery, de delivery and um, how do you know it wasn't changed? How do you know it, the person who sent it is the same person, that, that type of thing. Yeah. Blockchain? Uh, so blockchain uh, could fit under protocol. Let's put it here. So it's under, it's a subset of cryptography. Okay, so that could go under surveillance, um, but uh, let's, that's a good one, so let's put, 
your, let's call it organizations. And so, yeah, so it could be um, like law enforcement and yeah, FBI and things like that. Uh, uh, intelligence agencies, that type of thing. And uh, you, when you look at these agencies, uh, we're actually going to spend some time talking about a specific case, but uh, a lot of the important thing is the procedures that they follow. So they have certain procedures, you know, like top secret document classification that's in the news. Uh, and so like that's a whole procedure. How do you know that that actually works and what are the, what's the threat model and what happens if someone takes home top secret documents that they're not supposed to and keeps them in Florida? You know, whatever whatever the case may be. Um, so, so that's something where you could look at the the security of, of that system. And what about satellites? So satellites are fine. Yeah, well, we could consider them hardware. Hardware. Yeah. Okay, so we did pretty good. Uh, a few other ones. Uh, one is data itself. Maybe it falls under protocols. Um, but you could, you could think about data. And then the other one that's related to organizations, and this is something else that we're going to put a huge emphasis on this course. We'll look at it from two different angles, are humans. So we're not usually considering the security of a human per se directly, uh, but we are thinking about things like, can a human use this security tool, right? And if they can't use it, then, or if they're using it wrong, uh, then it's as good as them not using it at all. Right, so we call that usability. Uh, if I want access to your account, I could try to crack your password and there's some crypto and stuff that protects it. Or I could just call up customer service and say, hi, I'm you, I forgot my password, can you help me out? If I can convince them over the phone, right, then maybe I get access to you and I, I don't have to do any of this like password cracking or breaking SSL or anything like that. Uh, so we call that social engineering. And then it's sort of tied into organizations. Organizations are just a bunch of humans, right, that are all kind of working together, so. But anyways. Okay. So there's a couple reasons. Let's go back to our original question. So I could give you a safe and say, is it secure, right? Let's say you work at a safe company, right? Uh, or I could give you a drone and say, okay, are you sure that like no one's gonna hijack this drone? Uh, or I could give you a cryptographic protocol and say, okay, I'm using digital signatures and hash functions, you know, is that enough, right? Now, is the methodology that you use when you analyze the safe and the drone and the cryptography going to be the same? No. Probably not, right? Like, there's probably no, I can't tell you, oh, here's, here's something that you can do, and you, you, if you have a safe, you can do it on a safe, and if you have some math, you can do it on the math. If you have some data, you can do it on the data. If you have software, you can do it on top. No, it's like, everything has its own unique kind of methodology, okay? So in this course, it's you're, you're, I'm really limited in the sense that I can't teach you how to evaluate cryptography without you understanding cryptography, okay? So, um, so anyway, these are some of the challenges. Now we're gonna, obviously there's a course ahead of us. So there are some things that I can teach you um, that are, are gonna be higher level methodologies, but it's just something to keep in mind uh, before we start. It's just to sort of lower your expectations. Uh, evaluation is hard for a couple of reasons. Uh, so the first is there's no like single methodology that works for everything. Okay, the second is you need to know a lot about what your analyzing before you even think of the security of it. Like if you're going to look at the security of operating systems, you can't not know anything about operating systems, okay? So generally the flow would be like, you would learn a lot about operating systems without thinking about the security per se. And then once you know a lot about operating systems, then you can start asking yourself the security questions, okay? So security is usually the sort of secondary thing that you do, okay? So you need that domain specific knowledge to do a good job of, of looking at security. Now you don't have to have perfect knowledge, right? It's never too early to start thinking about security, right? So I don't wanna say, oh, 
don't start thinking about security until you really understand everything, right? You can introduce it early, but uh, in order to make progress, especially to answer a question like, okay, this is actually secure, um, you have to understand the domain, I'll say, very well uh, before assessing security. Okay, the last point is, is, is kind of weird. Uh, I'll, I'll, let me write it and then we'll, we'll talk about it. So uh, security methodologies are necessary but not sufficient. Okay, so the easiest way to think about this is let's take a more specific domain, like, like let's say software and a specific library. Like we'll spend a lot of time talking about something called HTTPS, just as an example. It'll be a working example. You don't have to know anything about it. Um, but uh, let's say that uh, we, we look at it. Now, you come up with a new library that does HTTPS and I'm, it's my job to tell you whether it's secure or not, okay? The first thing I'll do is I'll say, okay, what are all the past attacks? on HTTPS, right? So I have a list of 10 attacks. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through your library and I'm gonna say, okay, attack one, does it work or not? Attack two, does it work or not? Attack three, okay? And then I reach my end of, uh, the end of my list and I've checked you know, the 10 attacks that I know about. I'm pretty sure that, that you know, there aren't other attacks that people have discovered already. You know, I'm pretty current with the area. And your library passes all 10 attacks. So is your library secure? No. And why not? So there could be some new attack that nobody's thought of yet, right? And I, I can't say it, okay? So all I can say at the end of the day is, well, it's as secure as my like current knowledge, right? But that doesn't mean it's actually secure, okay? So security, you can never really be 100% sure, okay? Security is usually about trying to assess it based on you know, what you've seen. So it's necessary that you might say, okay, well, if at the end of the day you can't tell me whether it's secure or not, why should I pay you to check those 10 attacks? Like, what, why not just say, well, you can never be sure, so let's just deploy it, right? So it's still important to check those 10 attacks, right? Because if you don't, the hackers are going to check those 10, that's going to be the first thing they do, right? Metasploit has it built in, they're going to press one button and they're going to run through all those tests, okay? So it's still necessary to, to bring the security level up to your, past, uh, to your past knowledge, but it's not sufficient to say that it's truly secure, that's 100% secure, okay? So you're never going to be able to say that something's secure. And that should be good for you because if you want a job in security, right, it's good to work in an industry where, you know, things are never 100% secure, right? You're, you're always going to have a job. There's always going to be new attacks, uh, new things to check for, uh, coming up with new ways of attacking systems and things like that, okay? So after you're done your evaluation, You can say something like, um, you know, it isn't insecure with all of the things that I know about. Okay? So it's kind of a double negative, so it's hard to parse, but. So saying it's not insecure against these 10 attacks isn't the same as saying it's secure, right? It's not, because there might be an 11th attack uh, that you haven't thought of, okay? So at most, this is sort of what you can say. You can say, well, at least it's not insecure against all of these attacks that I've thought of, okay? Uh, but you can't say, you, can, you can't conclude ever that it is secure.
Okay, so most of the course will be kind of geared at this second, this first point, right? So part of it's like knowing the history and what are the, the, the types of attacks that, that have happened against different types of things. Okay, so, so lots of stories and examples and things like that uh, you'll learn uh, in this course itself. But it's also about kind of structuring that knowledge. So instead of just having a laundry list of here's 10 things, right? It's like, okay, well, what, what do they have to do with each other? Are they related to each other? If I knew about two of them, could I predict what the third would be? Um, that type of thing. And how do I present that? Like, so someone asked me if it's secure. Maybe my answer isn't a simple yes or no. Maybe it's, well, it's more secure than A, but it's less secure than B, but it costs way more uh, or something like that. And so, you know, how do you present that information and, you know, try and get people to, to, to understand, like security is not the only consideration, right? Security is often traded off with things like cost and, and other types of things, okay? So that, that's the type of content that we'll look at in the course itself. Okay, so for today, we'll talk about one, maybe two, depending on how much time we have, uh, high, very, very high level methodologies. And then as the course goes on, we're going to get more specific. Okay, so high level, what does that mean? It means it's actually applicable to basically any of these things. Okay, so it's a methodology where you could apply it to networks as well as crypto, as to drones, as to whatever, humans. Okay, so it's, that's what high level means. So it's applicable to, to all domains. But the trade-off is it's not going to tell you much about it. Okay, if, if I can give you a methodology that works as well on humans as on some crypto protocol, I'm not going to be able to tell you very much that's deep about those two things, right? It's really just a, a surface level uh, kind of dive into to what security might look like, okay? So it's most useful in the early days, in the early stages of trying to do a security assessment. It's useful just for getting started. It's somewhere to start, okay? And then you can start with this framework and then you can brainstorm what the possible attacks are. And then it just, yeah, it's kind of like a, a starting point. So it's a useful starting point. For what we call structured brainstorming. So you're not just throwing random ideas out. Brainstorming is just like, you know, people sitting around a room with a whiteboard like trying to come up with attacks. And also for organizing. So if you have to present your attacks to someone else, you, it gives you a way of, of organizing it. Okay, so I'm gonna give you three examples, or like in class, we'll look at three examples of these high level methodologies. So today we'll talk about something called Stride. Stride is from Microsoft Research. Uh, it's for evaluating one solution. So if you have, I don't know, Android or whatever, and you want to look at its security, you, you could use Stride, okay? Uh, now, if you want to compare Android and iOS, Stride, you could tr maybe try and use Stride, but uh, you want a general methodology for comparing two things, so that's, that's different. And so we'll look at uh, something called evaluation framework. And there can be overlap between these methodologies, but the evaluation framework is really for comparing more than one. Alternative. 
or you could say more than one solution. I actually specifically chose the term alternative uh, because uh, with an evaluation framework, and you're going to do this probably in assignment one, so it's something you'll have to learn. You, you really have to compare things that are substitutes for each other. So if you're, you're either using A or using B or using C, and, and that's how you uh, compare them. Uh, and then the last thing is an attack tree. And this is more specific than these two. It's more like Stride where you're evalu evaluating a single solution, but you're actually evaluating a single threat against a single solution. So, um, Or it could be a single uh, like property or something like that, that a system, a security property that a system should have. Okay, so stride we'll start with. Um, it's pretty simple, not much to see, but it, it is useful for getting started thinking about it. It's basically a way of classifying threats. So threats are potential attacks against a system. Okay, so you have a system. The opposite of a security property would be a, an attack. Uh, the word attack itself implies that, that it was actually done, right? So an attack is something that someone actually did. We tend to use threat, meaning that someone could potentially do it. So maybe they haven't done it yet, or, or maybe it seems like it, there could be an attack there, but we're not quite sure, or there's some missing pieces or whatever. So a threat is, is sort of softer than an attack. It, it, it could, it's a potential attack. It doesn't have to have happened. Um, so we use it, but you could use it for classifying attacks as well. Uh, threats are just sort of more general. And uh, usually if you pick up a security textbook, the first thing they teach you is something like Stride, but it's simpler uh, where uh, so stride is six categories. Uh, so you classify th threats into six categories. And uh, S-T-R-I-D-E stand for the six categories. So spoofing, tampering, uh, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and escalation of privilege. Uh, so I'll, I'll write those down in a second. Um, but yeah, you're, you're classifying threats into six categories. And usually in security, when you pick up like an introductory textbook, uh, they have a model that classifies it into three. So it's sort of an extension. Uh, so it builds on the what's called the CIA, not the spy agency, but, but the CIA model. So CIA is confidentiality. Uh, integrity and availability. So uh, I work a lot, I used to work a lot on uh, voting systems, so I'll use that as an example. So let's say we're having an election and there's a voting system. It might be on paper, it might be with an electronic voting machine or whatever. So confidentiality is when you cast your ballot, no one should know how you voted. Okay, so it's like secrecy of the election. So confidential private information should say private. And you can also think about who can see it. Like the voter can see it because they're filling out the ballot, right? But the person counting the ballot shouldn't be able to see it or the government six months later shouldn't be able to see it. Okay, so confidentiality isn't always, you can't see it at all or you can always see it. It can be in the middle. Like this person can see it, but this other person can't. Um, integrity would be like that the result is correct. Right, so if five votes were cast for Alice and four were voted for Bob, when the election results are announced at the end of the day, it is five and four. There were no votes that were changed or anything like that. So that's the integrity uh, over the election. And then availability is like the opposite of denial of service. So like, could I take the election offline? Like say it was an internet election. If I could bring down the election website, then no one could cast their ballots, right? Or maybe I go in and I break some of the voting machines in a particular district where there's a lot of Alice supporters. So then there's a huge lineup 
of people in that district, probably a lot of them are going to vote for Alice, but many of them might just go home because they're like, I'm not going to wait around four hours to vote for Alice. But in another district where it's, you know, just for Bob, I don't break the machines there. So they have like 10 machines and, and you know, it takes two minutes to vote in that particular district, okay? Uh, so that would be availability, for example. So those are three properties. Now these are positive properties that you want from the system. So you want the system to have confidentiality, you want it to have integrity, you want it to have availability, and if it has confidentiality, then it's preventing a threat. So the threat is kind of the opposite. So you have the positive property that you want and then you have the threat against it. So like availability is the property you want, denial of service is the threat uh, that, that would defeat availability. Okay, so what Stride does is it says, okay, these three are good, but there's some that are missing. There's, there's a couple other categories that don't really fit well into these. Uh, one of them, actually CIA is sometimes extended. Sometimes people call it CIAA. Uh, so one of the big ones that's missing is some sort of authentication. So like, who are you? How do I know that you are who you are? Um, so that's something sometimes added as a, a, another A. Um, so anyway, so Stride, I'll just show it to you. Okay, so STRIDE stands for spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, and escalation of privilege. So you can see it spells out STRIDE. Uh, this is the property that it violates. Okay, so this is, these are all attacks, and then these are sort of the corresponding pro properties. So you can see CIA is, is the corresponding property for, for these three, for tampering. So tampering is what defeats integrity Information disclosure is what defeats confidentiality. Denial of service is what defeats availability. Uh, they add spoofing. So spoofing is what defeats authentication. So how do I know that you are who you say you are? And authentication, you usually think of humans, but it doesn't have to be humans, right? It could be uh, computer code. How do I know that that library that I'm calling is the real library? How do I know it wasn't switched out? Uh, that type of thing. Um, tampering is modifying uh, data or code. Uh, repudiation is a little confusing. Um, so repudiation is basically uh, if something did happen, could you deny that it happened after, right? So let's say I order something on Amazon and it comes and it's delivered and then I go to Amazon and say, oh, hey, I never got that. Can you give me my money back? Okay, that's repudiation. Okay, so I'm repudiating the fact that I received the parcel. And so Amazon is going to have to figure out what are we going to do? That's an attack on our system. And are we going to give them the money or not? Right? So they might have delivery drivers take a picture of the box at your door. Right? So if they have a picture, they say, well, no, we think that you actually got the package. Right? Or they might have a policy where who cares, like we make so much money that if there's a little bit of fraud, it's okay. We just don't want it to grow beyond a certain amount. So, it, you know, the first time you say that, that a package was lost, they'll just give you your money back, right? But if you do it 10 times, then they're, they're not gonna give you your money back, okay? So they just, they, they accept it. They don't even care at first until you start asking a lot and then they start caring a lot. And, and maybe it escalates to the level where they, they monitor the situation or use surveillance or something like that. Okay, so that's, that's repudiation. Uh, uh, information disclosure is basically you have some, inf some data usually, uh, you want it to remain private uh, and uh, you don't want to expose and so you're going to hide it in some way. Um, it doesn't have to be data. It could be, um, you know, it could be like where your vehicle is, right, at particular, where you are as a person, like where you're walking around. So sometimes that's turned into data, like you might have a fitness tracking device or a, a, you're walking around with a cell phone, your cell phone is pinging all the cell towers around you, right? The distance it takes for the packet to reach a cell tower and come back, right? That tells you something about how far you are from the cell tower, right? And if I can get three cell towers and I can measure how much time your ping is between all three of them, I can actually get a pretty accurate location of where you are, okay? And so I could trace you as you move around just because you carry a cell phone, for example. 
Right, so anyway, so that would fall under information disclosure. So it's not always about data. Uh, it, it could be things like, like that as well. Denial of service is an attack on availability. Um, so the most common example would be like, you wanna crash a website uh, and bring it down. So that's a denial of service attack. Uh, it, could, it could be other things too. Like, like maybe I just wanna crash your computer, uh, so I'll get it doing some process, like an infinite loop or something like that, and, and you can't suspend it for, for whatever reason, and so I'm gonna crash it. Um, later we'll see uh, an attack where, um, where yeah, they, they basically the attacker wanted to get a server to reboot because once it reboots, then it goes through a certain process that was useful for that attack. Um, so so the, the start of the attack was a sort of denial of service where they're just trying to get the computer to reboot. And then once they, they can get it to reboot, then they can do what they, they actually wanted to do. And then the final thing is uh, escalation or elevation of privilege. Um, and so this is where, this one also is, is like, um, uh, it's kind of like repudiation, it's sort of hard to, to understand or it's sometimes hard to distinguish from the others because it's closely related to spoofing. Uh, but basically it has to do with authorization, which is what permissions do you have to do things, right? So for example, as a, well let's use Moodle. So as a student on Moodle, you can't change the course website. I'm an instructor, so when I log in, I can change the content of the website. So I have privileges that you don't, okay? So we have different roles. Our roles are attached to privileges. Uh, if we have a TA for the course, they may have some privileges that are halfway between what you can do and what I can do, for example, okay? Now let's say there was a way for you somehow through an exploit to get my permission, right? Then you could go ahead and, and change uh, the course website, okay? So we would call that an escalation of privilege. So the most common example uh, is operating systems uh, don't allow you to make changes to, say, the hard drive in locations outside of the application data for a specific user. So when I'm logged into my computer, I'm logged in with a user account. I'm not a super user. I don't have administrative purpose or privileges. I can't just write arbitrarily to like, like the system files and the operating system part. But if I have software and, I, and it's installing and it needs to do that, or it's telling me that it needs to do it, then I would put in a password that says, yeah, I'm, I'm giving permission to this software uh, in order to modify whatever. And then that's dangerous because if the software is malicious, then it can make deep-seated changes, right? It could install malware at a very deep level where it's gonna be hard for me to detect it and hard for me to remove it, okay? So if someone's designing malware and they can trick a user into installing the software and somehow they're able to break out of the container of being just a, an installation that's done at the user level and be an installation that's done at the systems level without prompting the user, that would be an escalation of privilege, okay? So if you go through like, I don't know, bugs in Windows or Mac or Linux, but mostly Windows, uh, you see a lot of escalation of privilege attacks. So it just means that there was some malware, they found some way that if you just click a link, like if you look at a website, it shouldn't affect your hard drive. Right, because it's just a website, it's in the browser, it's not allowed, but if you're able to break out of the container of the browser, get something installed, break out of the container of just being a user level installation and you know, install as a systems level tool, right? then you can trick users that just click on a link in a phishing email or something like that into like basically taking over their computer. Right? And so that would be an escalation of privilege attack because you're not supposed to be able to do that. Uh, but, but somehow, you know, through exploits, uh, people were able to do it. Um, so that's, that's usually where escalation of, of privilege shows up. Um, I'll just give you a few notes on two of these things. So for spoofing, uh, one kind of attack that we see now more often than we did before has a really funky name. So it's called T-O-C-U-T-O-U. -T -O -U. Uh, so this is time, sorry, V. So a lot of exploits follow this pattern. Uh, so it's called time of check versus time of use. Uh, let me illustrate it with a, like a real, more real-world example. So let's say you go to 
Uh, let's say you go to a club and uh, you need to show ID to get it. Okay, so you wait in line. Uh, the bouncer is like, can I see your ID card? Okay, and so you have your ID card and, they, uh, and you give it to them. So they look at the ID card and then they look at your face and they're comparing them to make sure it's you know, not your friend's ID or whatever. And, uh, and, and so they're satisfied. So they say, okay, this is the person. I'm looking at the ID, I see the birth date, they're old enough uh, to come in the club, and I see that their face matches the other person's face, okay? So then they're going to hand the card back to you, okay? So they're, now imagine you could slow down time. This is impossible, but pretend that you could slow down time, okay? So as they like take their gaze off the card and start looking up to you to hand it out, Imagine if your friend could jump into like where you were standing and they hand the card back to your friend instead, then your friend run, walks into the club, okay? So what happened here is the time of use was the authorization to enter the club and the time of check was me looking at the ID. And there's a time gap, there's always a time gap between when you check something and then when you grant the permission to do what you wanna do, okay? So in this case, I checked the ID and it was the right person, but at that moment when I'm handing the card back, that person switches out for someone else. I hand it back to the wrong person, the wrong person goes into the club, okay? Now that sounds stupid because you can't do that in real life, but could you do that on a computer? Absolutely, right? Things can pause, operating systems suspend, there's processes, they switch, you know, whole new applications can load. Uh, that, that's very common, like that, that, that's something that happens in computers all the time, right? And so you can check some process, you're satisfied with it, and then as you're in the process of giving permission to it, it could swap out for something completely different, okay? Um, so you want that continuity of, am I giving permission to the same thing that I checked, okay? So that's, for example, like an advanced kind of spoofing attack. Um, denial of service, I'll also talk a little bit about some, some more advanced versions of it. Okay, so denial of service, let's take the example of a website and you just wanna bring it down. So we have our website. We have our user. They're malicious, so we'll put devil horns on them. And uh, they wanna take the website down, okay? So traditional classic denial of service is they just spam the website with as much traffic as they can muster. So they try and get you know, they pay for the premium internet so they have the most bandwidth possible and they just send ping messages or something like that to the website one after the other, okay? And the website has to process it to decide do I need to form this connection or should I drop it? So it has to do something, it has to look at the traffic and it's getting mixed in with all the legitimate traffic that's going in and so even if they're going to drop everything, they have to look at it, they have to inspect it enough to decide that they're going to drop it. And so that's going to take some processing time. So, so there's no real way for the website to combat it other than they have more bandwidth than the bandwidth that you can throw at it, okay? So that's, that's how it, it uh, started. Then what people said is, okay, websites now, they have lots of bandwidth and they pay people like, I don't know, Cloudflare or whatever uh, to, to, to host their websites and they have tons of bandwidth and we can't do this anymore, right? Uh, no, no end user has enough bandwidth to, to actually do this and their ISP is going to notice it and shut them off and blah, 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 right? So then what do you do? You recruit a bunch of friends, right? So you say, okay, let's get 10 people from 10 different computers around the world and these could be computers that we took over with malware. It could be computers that we're renting so you can go out and rent computers that have malware on them. Uh, it's called a botnet. And, uh, and so anyways, and you can aim, you can rent them for, I don't know, five hours and have them all spam the same website for five hours. And then maybe the sum total of all your bandwidth is greater than the website and then it will bring it down. Okay, so this is called distributed denial of service. So DOS is denial of service. Or DDoS. All right, so you take a network security course, you'll learn about DDoS attacks or whatever. 
Okay. Now here's the sort of fancier version. So so for a while, I don't know, when I was a kid or whatever, it was just normal denial of service. Then we went through a phase where everyone's doing distributed denial of service. Now when no one really does it, or there's a better way of doing distributed denial of service, uh, which are called amplification attacks. So in an amplification attack, what you do is you find, well, let's draw it in like this. So here's our server that we want to take down. Here's the user. Okay, what we do is we go out on the internet and we ask ourselves, uh, is there any protocol where there, we need a couple conditions uh, to make this work? One is, uh, can we, uh, okay, let, let me back up a bit. Uh, when you connect to a server and you're going to talk over that connection, there's two main protocols that you use at what's called the transport level. It doesn't really matter that much, but uh, there's something called TCP and UDP, okay? 90% of what you do, 95% of what you do is TCP. And TCP, the main difference is that in TCP, you do what's called a handshake. So when I connect to the server, I send it a message that says hi, it sends a message back that says hi, and then I say, oh, I, I, I heard about your hi, so now we both know each other, and so now I'm gonna start sending you data or whatever, so that's called a handshake, okay? Now sometimes for some applications, um, and handshakes are useful, TCP adds a bunch of other stuff for it. The most useful thing is if packets get dropped, then you hear about it. So it de depending, let's say the server's dropping packets as they're coming to you, you're learning, oh, I'm missing some packets. You're going to ask the server again, and then the server is going to resend them, and then you're going to put them in the right order, okay? So with TCP, you should always get 100% of, of kind of what, you're, what the server's trying to send you. It might take a while, uh, but you're going to go back and forth until you get 100% of your data. Now, there are some types of things where you don't really care. Well, you always care about drop packets, but you don't care about replacing them if they get dropped. So the biggest example would be, let's say you're watching Netflix and they're streaming you a movie and some packets get dropped, okay? So whatever, the frame rate of the movie j jitters a bit or the audio goes wonky or whatever, okay? But do you care about getting those packets eventually? Like in five minutes, are you like, hey, I, I still want those packets from like five minutes ago. You don't care because the movie's moved on from there anyways, right? So you just deal with packet loss, like it, it gets jittery or whatever, and you can buffer and things like that to like try and, and prevent it. Um, but, but ultimately, if the packet's lost, you've moved on, you don't care about it anymore, okay? So there's a protocol called UDP that's for that. In UDP, you just start sending data right away and you don't do the handshake, okay? So you send data and then it just sends the data back and, the, and that's it, okay? So that's the first like sort of key piece of information. Um, so uh, UDP, there's no handshake. So we're going to exploit UDP. It has to be UDP. If it's a TCP thing, it's not, it's not going to work. Um, the other thing that we can do is called IP spoofing. So when you send a packet, you it's just like a piece of mail. You say, okay, it's going to this IP address, and the server is going to, like, you're like, start playing the video, right? So you send that message, start playing the video. The server is going to send you the video files, but it has to know where to send it back. So it has to know your IP address, okay? So packets have a destination and they have a source, okay? Now, you can write any other IP address into the source, right? So you can say, hi, I'm Google, I'm asking for this video, send it to Netflix, and then they're going to start sending the video to Google, okay? Now, in TCP, that won't work exactly. What will happen in TCP is you'll say, hi, I'm Google, and then Netflix will say, hey, Google, I'm, I'm Netflix, and it will send it to Google, and then Google will say, I never said hi to you, why are you saying hi to me, and it will just drop it, okay? So you won't get, you'll never complete the handshake doing IP spoofing in TCP. But in UDP, because there's no handshake, you just you send it and it immediately responds with the data, uh, then you, IP spoofing makes a lot more sense, okay? So what you can do is if you wanna do denial service against a server, you're gonna use IP spoofing. So basically you're gonna go to some other third party and you're gonna send a message uh, that basically says, you know, I am server and I want 
whatever data. And this server will say, okay, great, I, I'll get that data ready for you. And then it will, instead of sending it back to you, it's going to send it on to the server, okay? So you're, you're sort of tricking it into sending information. And because it's UDP, it doesn't care about the handshake or anything like that, okay? Now, if, um, so this is a UDP server. Now, in order to make this an effective denial of service, and, and the, the name is called amplification, what we look for is, are there, first off, are there servers where you can just go ask for data and you can ask over UDP and it will say, sure, I'll send it to you. So it turns out that there are a bunch of like real bare bones internet protocols where you can do that, where servers by default, they have it turned on where if you ask them over UDP for different things, they'll, they'll tell you the information. So one of the protocols that's being fixed now uh, but, but worked you know, five years ago maybe is called NTP. So this is a time protocol. I forget what the N is. Um, network, okay, network time protocol. So basically, you can walk to any server and just say, hey, what time is it? You ask over UDP and it will send you the time, okay? So if you wanted to denial service the server, you could say, what, what time is it, what time is it, what time is it, what time is it, and say that this message is coming from the server, then it's going to spam the time to the server, okay? But the amount of bandwidth you'll use saying, what time is it, what time is it, what time is it, is about the same bandwidth as, it, as like, it's four o'clock, it's four o'clock, it's four o'clock, okay? But what if you were able to say like, hey, tell me the last 10,000 people who connected to you and asked for the time. Ask me the last 10,000, ask me the last 10,000, ask me the last 10,000, and then the NTP server is saying, here's five megabytes of data, here's five megabytes of data, here's five megabytes of data. So if its response is like say 10 times bigger than the request, then what you're doing is you're, you're asking as fast as you can using all your bandwidth, and it's responding as fast as it can, but it's responding with something that's 10 times bigger. Okay, so now you've, you've taken your traffic and you've blown it up by 10 times. Okay, so the server gets hit with, you know, like a, a large amount of bandwidth. Is, for example, 10 times larger. Okay, and then what you can do is you can combine it with distributive denial service. Okay, so you can still go out, you can rent your bot armies, and you can get them all to do this type of thing. Now, the, the other problem that can go wrong is what if you end up denial of servicing the, the, the NTP server itself, right? You're asking its requests and it can't keep up with its responses. Well, that's fine, you can find 10 different servers, send a tenth of your request to each of them, and then have them all send it back to the same server. And the other thing is that the kinds of servers that offer NTP, often they're like the real backbone servers of the internet. Like they're things that are put up there by Rogers and Bell and big telecoms. And those are the servers and they can handle a lot of bandwidth, okay? And so you can really go and you can hit them. So things like NTP give you about a 10X um, amplification, but most people are turning off ND NTP now because it's being abused. Uh, for this purpose, and you don't really need it. Like people don't usually use it, anyways. Um, and uh, but there's a new protocol called DNSSEC. And so DNS is uh, I have Google.com. I want the IP address of Google.com. And so I go ask DNS, and it says, okay, it's 8.8.4.4 or whatever. Um, and so then that's uh, that's the DNS system. DNSSEC, it adds a bunch of crypto. So like, how do I know the DNS server isn't lying to me? Well, it's going to be signed. And the signature from this server is going to be signed by the signature for, like the server for the, all of the dot coms. And that's going to be signed by VeriSign, who's the certificate authority or whatever. So you get like five signatures on, on this data when you get it back. And it can easily be like 90 times larger, right? Like go resolve google.com is pretty short and then you get back this big crypto blob that has a bunch of signatures and stuff like that. That could be 90 times as big, right? And so you could get uh, amplification that's, that's even bigger. It runs over UDP because DNS is, is really like, it's, you're hitting DNS all the time, right? You go to a website, you, you, you have to load every image that's on the website. You could be hitting DNS 10, 50 times, 15 times just to load one website. So like uh, they, they don't have time for TCP. Um, and uh, 
by the way, that, that also caused problems uh, with DNS. So anyway, so that's, that's a, 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 an example of sort of more advanced threats. So these, the stride model itself, it gives you like really broad categories, but then to do a good job with stride, you do need that domain knowledge to like drill down and think about, okay, denial of service, well, you know, we don't have to just read deny or degrade service to users, we have to think about uh, the more technical details of, of what that means. Okay, uh, let's move on to the second of the three that we'll talk about. So an evaluation framework is a tool that you can use to compare alternatives. And you already know what an evaluation framework is before I even tell you about it. It's just a comparison chart. So it looks like a table, and the rows are like your different systems, and then you have a bunch of check marks, like yes, it does this, it does this, and the other one does other things. So there's a different set of check marks for different systems, and then you look at it and you decide, oh, I like, I like system three because it has the most check marks or whatever, okay? That's all an evaluation framework is. But there is an art in how you create them so that they're actually useful, particularly in communicating security properties and things that trade off uh, between security. Um, so evaluation framework isn't used to evaluate a single option. Really, it's not that useful. It's, it's better if you have a bunch of alternatives. And it's most useful when um, there isn't a winner amongst a bunch of solutions. So you might have, like say, I don't know, operating systems are way too broad, but just to, to use that example, like is Android better than iOS? I don't know, like there's no clear answer, right? Like iOS is probably better at some things, but Android's better at other things, okay? And so a lot of security is like that. There's trade-offs between all your different alternatives. There's no silver bullet that's, that's good on everything that you want it to be good on, okay? And so evaluation frameworks are, are particularly well-suited when, when you have trade-offs. Um, so economists often say there are no solutions, only trade-offs. Now, evaluation frameworks, uh, they're not so useful if you can do, like you could say, well, what if I use both Android and iOS? What if I like merge them and now I have this like super operating system, right? So sometimes that doesn't make sense for that. Like they're true alternatives. Like you're either using one or the other, okay? But like, should I use, I don't know, passwords or keys or like a keypad? Well, you could have a lock on the door and a keypad, right? And so sometimes, they're not truly alternatives. You could, you could do all of them if you wanted to, okay? And so evaluation frameworks are also useful for comparing things that are actually alternatives to each other, where once you choose to do one, you're probably not doing one of the others. It's not like you're layering them on top of each other. Uh, the other thing it's not good for is like when something is explicitly better than something else. So you might say, um, um, uh, so like for internet, like for wireless security, there was a protocol called WEP, and then it was replaced by WPA, and then there's WPA2. So you wouldn't really do an evaluation framework between WEP, WPA1, and WPA2, because WPA2 is better than all of them. It's better than WEP in all regards, right? Like there's, there's, no, there's nothing that's not better. You would just, if you want to use it, you're going to use WPA2 kind of thing. So uh, pre comparing like newer versions to older versions, it's not so useful for either. It's really for, these are true alternatives and I'm, I'm trying to decide which of the two to deploy. So the deliverable of it is a simple chart. So you have a bunch of things that you might do. You have a bunch of properties or criteria. So that's prop for property. So 
So this one has, I don't know, one, and it maybe has, we'll do like maybe a half dot. So it kind of does two, but not very well. And this one's really good at three, and this one's good at two, and it kind of is okay at three, but it doesn't have one or whatever. Okay, so you have a chart like this, and are you going to do one, two, or three? Well, it depends. Do you care a lot about property one? Like if property one is the most important thing to you, then you're going to go with alternative one because the other two don't have it. If you don't really care about property one, you might say, well, alternative three looks good because it has the most kind of dots all the way across. Actually, I guess one and three have it. So you might say, well, I, I don't want two for sure because it only has one dot, but these have two. So how you interpret the chart, we're not going to tell you. Okay, so evaluation framework is just about making the chart. It's not telling the person how to choose from the chart itself. It's just presenting all of the information uh, in, in a kind of systematic form. Okay, now you might say, okay, this easy peasy, this is like, why, why is this in a course? It's, uh, it's too simple. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to concentrate a lot on the properties themselves. And I'll tell you from the onset that choosing properties are hard. Okay, it's hard to come up with good properties. And I've done a lot of these charts and you know, in their in academic papers, and we spend months like debating about like what the property should be. And is this property just a rephrasing of another property, or should this property get split into like two different properties, that type of thing? And about the dots, is that a half dot or is it a full dot and, and things like that. So like um, it looks really easy when you're just shown one, you're like, oh yeah, that's easy. But when you actually do it, which you'll do in assignment one probably, um, you'll, you'll find that it's, it's, it's harder than it looks. Okay, so an evaluation framework is, when it, it, it's applied to security, it doesn't have to be necessarily about security, but the security course, so we'll consider security ones. Uh, it Basically, it's trying to communicate a few things. Um, so the one thing is that there are trade-offs. Um, so the, there's probably no one alternative that's best. Uh, it depends on what you care about. Another thing it's going to try to do, and this is going to be a theme of this course, is it's going to try to think about, get you thinking about uh, the fact that there's more to security than security itself. So if, for example, take cost, right? Cost isn't a security property, okay? But if there's a secure system that costs a million dollars and an insecure, a less secure system that costs a hundred dollars, right? You might decide, well, I can't afford the secure system, so I'm going with the $100 system, okay? So secure, or sorry, costs influence your decision about security, even though cost isn't about security. Okay? So if you're going to make a security decision, you obviously are going to consider all the security properties, but you have to consider all the other properties that may dictate whether someone wants to do it or not, okay? So, um, so you, you have to think holistically about the system itself and not just about the security properties. So when we do our evaluation frameworks, we're not just going to have security properties. We're going to have security properties. We're going to have what we call deployability. Deployability is how easy is it to deploy the system. Uh, how many computers do you have to change? You have to change the software on every server in the world. Uh, cost, how much does it cost? Do you have to like put up servers that are serving up information? Like, like what does it mean to really deploy the system? Because if the deployability is bad, right, then it doesn't matter how good the security is, a lot of people aren't going to use it. And then we're also going to consider usability. So usability is the human, right? If the human's using the system, can they use it? If usability is off, Right? It might have the best security properties, but you know, users have to memorize a 128-bit crypto key and then, and then it's secure. Then you have your most secure instant messaging. So it looks great on security, gets all the check marks where you want it to, but users can't memorize a 128-bit key, right? Or they're gonna input it wrong. Even if they memorize it, when they go to type it out, they're gonna make typos and things like that, right? And so it's just never gonna work. Yeah, yeah, so it can be used either as an attack, so that's one thing, or it's just like you never deploy the system in the first place because, yeah, it doesn't, 
uh, because users, or you deploy it for three months, users hate it, and they stop using it, and they start like they just start sending emails again because they can't use the system type of thing. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, we want to encourage you to think holistically about security. Um, we want it to be a neutral presentation of information. So we're not trying. It's not a sales pitch. So sometimes, you know, authors use these to like try and show that, oh, what we're proposing has the most dots or whatever. So sometimes it's not used in a neutral way. It's used kind of as a sales pitch. But uh, there's other papers, they're called SOK papers or systemization of knowledge, where they just come up with one of these tables and they're not trying to sell you on something. They're not trying to tell you that A is better than B. They're just trying to neutrally evaluate all of them. Here's the table, you know, it's up to you uh, to, to decide what you think looks good and what doesn't look good based on it. Um, in the cells itself, we use dots. So you can, there's no rules about it. So you can do it, you could do numbers or whatever, but a system that works pretty well is a kind of like a three dot system. So like a full, meaning it like fully satisfies whatever the property is. It partially satisfies And usually a partial satisfaction is, it's not like 50%, it's more like, like 80%. Like it's, it almost satisfies it, but it's just not quite there for whatever reason. And then, it, and then uh, one for it, it doesn't. Either because it doesn't try to satisfy it, like some systems just aren't designed to do it, or maybe it tries to do it, but it fails. And the last point is that the properties, we want to always phrase them what we call positively. So I might have a property be like, it's vulnerable to denial of service, right? And then you, you, know, you get the dot if you're vulnerable to denial of service, and you don't get the dot if you're not vulnerable to denial of service. Um, and, th and that's fine. And so in that case, you don't want the dot, right? The dot is a bad thing. You don't want it. Now, that makes it hard for the reader because the reader picks it up, and half of the properties are things that you want, and half the properties are things you don't want. So then you have to really read the property and think about, okay, do I want the dot or do I not want the dot for this particular property? So in order to, to, to resolve that, what we do is we always make it so that you want the dot, okay? So I won't say it's vulnerable to denial of service. I would say it's... it's prevents denial of service, or it's not vulnerable. So I'll always reverse the grammar of, of the property. So whatever the property is, it's something you want. So more dots are always better, okay? And it just makes it, it's a lot easier to read the chart uh, because when you see a dot, you know it's a good thing. It's always a good thing. It doesn't depend on the column itself. And it's easy to do that reversal. It's just a matter of, of grammar. So like, for example, um, vulnerable to denial system, to denial service is a bad property name because you, you don't want the dot if I called it that. But if I said it's resilient to denial of service. I'm measuring the exact same thing. I'm basically saying whether the system does something about denial of service or not. But I'm just changing the phrasing of it. So now you want you want this property. So, so in this sense, you want the dot, OK? So when you go through the properties, you're always going to phrase them positively. And so that takes a bit of work. OK, so next class, what we'll do is we'll walk through an example, uh, which will be password alternatives, so things that you could do instead of passwords. And uh, we'll do an evaluation for American class. You'll do one for your assignment. And I'll show you an academic paper so you can see like what a professional looking evaluation framework does.
Yeah. Yes, you can. You you have to. Yeah. Usability plus everything. Yeah, yeah. So deployability, usability will be things that we'll consider in addition to security itself. And it's going to tell a more complete story about the whole thing. So uh, not all of the properties must be about security. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. It, it, that's a requirement. So so you you have to have more than security properties. And the properties you have will differ based on whatever you're evaluating. So the properties for passwords are going to be different than the properties for operating systems or whatever. And for the first um, um, model, yep. uh, you said uh, there is a solution for that, but uh, it was just uh, defining the um, different threads. What is the solution for that? So uh, we'll use Stride itself. Yes, uh, for a Stride. Okay, so Stride yep. is defining different threads. And the methodology for that is a solution, yes? Yeah, so the methodology is just coming up with the possible threats itself. And I, sorry, I like kind of, I didn't close up Stride itself because I know what material is coming next. So we're going to come back to Stride itself. So when we do the evaluation framework and we come up with these properties, the security properties, we're going to think about Stride. So like there's going to be properties that have to do with spoofing and tampering and integrity. So you'll see how Stride plugs in. And then when we do attack trees, um, I'll give an example. And it basically, there's going to be an attack. And we're going to think of every possible way to do that attack. And we can use Stride then to say, OK, well, is there a spoofing attack here? Or is there a tampering it's attack? Not yet. Yeah, so it's, it's incomplete still at this point. OK, any other questions? OK, sounds good. So I'll see you all next week.